in symbolic language, uh, as was said to the seven churches in the first three chapters. But now we start to get into uh, some interesting kind of imagery that is used to help us uh, be comfortable with what our hope is uh, residing in. So uh, the throne, the lamb, and the book today. Next week, 144,000 of God's people will be uh, chapter 7. Steve will handle that. And it's all referencing back into the supremacy of the church and how the, the church is uh, uh, reigns supreme uh, over the nations through Christ, of course, as the head. So the whole mission here is to get us to not lose heart. If you were to read Hebrews, you would see the same kind of thing. But this is a broader audience than just the Hebrews, isn't it? This is to churches that are uh, filled with people who came out of Judaism or maybe Jewish by birth, but they have uh, turned to Christ or they came out of paganism and they were converted and became Christians. And, it, and they're being persecuted and they're having a hard time. And especially the Jewish Christians that have come out of uh, the complete and utter destruction that uh, uh, Jerusalem ha has uh, in, 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 or will, <laughs> depending on if you believe this was written early or late, uh, uh, it shortly will be destroyed by Titus and the Romans, or it uh, will, uh, it has already happened, and in such case it would be still quite devastating to have the temple no longer there. At any rate, the point here being don't lose heart, remain faithful, because God is sovereign, not Caesar, <laughs> but God. And all authority is given to Christ, the Son. We know he said this was his last statement before he leaves to go uh, to ascend to the Father's right hand. He says, all power has been given to me on heaven and earth. And it's, uh, it's comforting uh, to know that he sits at the right hand of the Father. Look, all things have been handed over me uh, by my Father. Luke chapter 10, Jesus says. And uh, in Ephesians, we have here a description after the fact of what really happened. So God, he raised him, God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the Father's right hand in the heavenlies. In the Greek, it's just the heavenlies. We say in heaven, but it's kind of a neat thing to know that it actually uses this term heavenlies. And uh, so he's sitting, seating at the right hand of the Father far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And later he goes on to say, and the father put all things under his feet and gave him uh, to be head over all things to the church. Ephesians chapter one and following. So you see where the supremacy uh, of his headship is, that he has been given all authority and all power. And we should take great confidence in understanding the sovereignty of God and that he is able to change things and move things and take care of us. So let's read chapter 4 very quickly, and then we'll get into this slide. Chapter 4 begins, after these things, after what things? After the, the instructions to the seven churches, with those lampstands and all that kind of language, he set, starts off by saying, after these things I looked and... Behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must uh, take place after this. Now, is there any other place in Scripture? We'll stop the reading there for a second. Is there a place in Scripture that comes to mind where you hear a voice? You have a loud voice? You have a trumpet? <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes to the church in Corinth in verse 52 and says what? With a trump, everything's going to boom. The last thing, the last trump. Jesus doesn't set foot on the earth again. What happens? It says he'll, we'll meet him in the air. And so this is started by a loud voice, the voice of the archangel, the trump will sound. And so this is very interesting because it's just the opposite of that. This is in the beginning, not at the end. He says, 
The first voice which I heard when I was taken up here to listen, uh, to see what was going on in heaven, uh, to see the throne room and that kind of thing, he said, like a trump speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you the things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. That's the father. That's the father's throne. It's not talking about Christ, talking about uh, the Father, God. And he who sat there was like Jasper and a Sardis stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. I got some green emerald in this slide, but it's just not as bright as I think it'll probably likely be. All right, I didn't do the, I just uh, pilfered off the internet. So you can't see it too well, but in his right hand on the throne is the scroll. And then you have the uh, 24 elders and you have the four beasts and we'll get into that in just a second. But this is an image, some artist uh, conception of what he's reading, what we're reading here. So there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Before we go on, where does a, emerald, uh, where does a rainbow of all colors, where does a rainbow, the spectrum, where does it show up first in scripture? Ah, Genesis, Jim says. And what is the event? It's a covenant. After the flood, he will not do what? He won't destroy the earth by water again. Okay, there is a covenant relationship. That's what the rainbow is symbolic of, in my opinion. <laughs> so, plus it must make the throne room even prettier. Okay, but can you see the covenant relationship that he's making here? He's maintained his covenant, and it's a beautiful thing to be arrayed behind and all around that throne. We didn't do justice to it, right, on the uh, slide. All right, so we have the rainbow around the throne and the appearance is like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. Who are they? Okay, we'll talk about it in a second. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded... Uh, lightnings and thunderings and voices and seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne which are we get an interpretation here doesn't help too much but a little bit those are the seven spirits the seven spirits of God now didn't we just read about the seven spirits of related to the seven churches the seven lampstands and the seven churches that were discussed. So he's talking about these are representative of the entire body of Christ. Those seven types of personalities that churches can have, that type of thing. All right, so the seven spirits where um, the seven lamps with fire burning and the seven spirits of God. So verse six, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. And the first living creature was like a, a lion. And the second living creature was like a calf. And, or you may have ox. And the third living creature was, had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was uh, like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, 
to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. That's chapter 4. So the rainbow stands for a covenant. Genesis chapter 9. And I, the covenant here, as I, as I think about it, is, the, is for protection against judgment. They may be su uh, suffering so much, they may wonder if the judgment is imputed to them. And so this is a, a, a reference for them, a comfort to them, a, uh, a hope that is placed before them, an assurance that they are not the the cause of these things. They are not going to be, they are not currently suffering this judgment from God, but it is the judgment that is being executed on others, and they are suffering some of the consequences. But it, he's protecting them uh, not to escape the suffering, but the exemption from the judgment itself, uh, which would come upon the enemies of the church. Myra. Who wants me? Oh. We look alike. Yes, the door is, uh, Chris brings to our attention, a door opening to heaven. And what does he say later? Behold, knock. Right? But this is a door that's already open to him. It's open. And your point? It just reminded me of Jesus in the fact that the door symbolizes an entry point and only those who are authorized to enter can enter. Right. And so it's not a question of the door. It's open to John, so he may enter into Yes, so it was open especially to John for this purpose to see, but also Jesus makes the reference in John chapter 14 and. Um, Verse 6 says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. In other places, he goes on to say that he is the door. He is the door to the sheep fold, whole, you know, the place where they come into the pen at night. And so he's the, he's the shepherd, the good shepherd, and he is protecting the sheep. And so that door uh, keeps things out and brings people and brings things in, in this case. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, he's powerful, knowing. Those eyes would indicate that he can see what's going on. Yes, we're going to talk about that in just a second. So um, this imagery that is used conveys that kind of thinking, that sovereignty, that power, that knowledge. Knowledge breeds power, right? Knowledge breeds confidence. We have a lot of confidence in the one, our God, who can see it all. Who can be there? Let's turn before I forget. Let's turn to uh, uh, Hebrews chapter nine and beginning in about verse twenty-three. Hebrews nine and verse twenty-three and following. This is an, this is um, the Hebrew writer's uh, uh, confidence that he gives to Jews that had been familiar with uh, the temple and the sacrifices that occurred inside the temple. And he was, he was saying that this, this is very similar that what John is able to see in the throne room. Let's begin reading here. So therefore it was necessary that the copies, so there's the old covenant and the shadows and the things that would come later, the real thing. He's saying the copies of the things in heaven would be uh, purified with these. But the, uh, the heavenly things themselves would, uh, with a better sacrifices than these. So who was the perfect better sacrifices than uh, the red heifer and the, and the heave offering and the, all the various offerings that they would give on the altars? It's Christ the Lamb. We're about ready to read, read about the Lamb. All right? So he's saying a better offering, better sacrifices than these, these old offerings. And then in chapter 9 of Hebrews, verse 24 and following. 
For Christ, now it takes, takes away all the conjecture. For Christ has not entered the holy places with hands, made, by, made with hands, which are copies of the true thing, but into heaven itself. That's where Christ is into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Wow. He's high priest. He's our king. He's our sacrifice. He's our intercessor. intercessor. And so as a result, we have here uh, into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often, as high priest uh, enters into the holy place each year with blood of another. You know, they had to cleanse themselves before they even went in. But Jesus didn't have to do that. No, he's just going to offer himself once on the cross, one time, came to the earth one time, lived a life sinless one time, endured all the temptations of life, yet without sin. One life. One sacrifice, one offering on the cross. And then verse 26, that he should uh, had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. He would have to keep doing this, but no, that's not the case. But now once at the end of the ages, end of the Old Testament age, he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This lamb. What did John call him again? Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's what he says to John's own disciples when he comes to him at Jordan to be baptized. He appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 27, one we should really know. Uh, it's appointed for men once to die and after that the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly await him, he will appear the second time. Ah, 1 Corinthians 15 again. He'll appear the second time, apart from sin, for salvation. He's going to save us from what? From destruction, from judgment, from hell. He's going to save us from our enemies. And he's going to unite us with himself. He's going to deliver the kingdom over to the Father. He's going to deliver the bride at the great wedding day. That's judgment day. All right, back to Revelation. I got that on my system. <laughs> I love Hebrews. Anytime I can teach Hebrews and get away with it, I, I do. All right, so back to chapter 4. So we see here that Christ rules his kingdom and, and over the nations even today. In effect, his uh, subjects, that would be you and I, in this kingdom, the borders of the kingdom are well known. You have to enter and get, you know, uh, uh, permission to get into the kingdom a certain way. How do we put on Christ? How do we enter into the kingdom? Well, we need to change our, we have to hear what, how to get in. And then we, then we say, I believe it. He's king. I believe he's the lamb. I'm going to repent of my sins. I'm not going to walk the way I used to. And you confess this. And then after you've done all that, then the point in which you, you gain entrance is after doing so, then you, you are immersed into water and you walk in newness of life. You gain entrance into the kingdom. That's how you enter in. Yes, Jim. Yes. And yet here in verse 11, after verse 10, we're talking about the 24 elders bowing down. Right. Before uh, him that sat on the throne. Right. Yes. Uh, it goes on to say in verse 11. Yes. Uh, o Lord, thou art worthy, O Lord. Right. Glory and honor and power. Yes. Well, that word Lord there is Messiah, not Hazer. Yes. yes. And so I'm a little confused about the one sitting on the it's not referring to the Father here in verse 11, but the Messiah, the Son. So, why did There are two thrones. 
There are two thrones, and one could read this as you are suggesting that this is Christ that is being uh, venerated and honored here. I believe that happens in the next chapter, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you, uh, I, I, I'm a student as you. However, uh, it is important to note that in the Greek, there are uh, words that are used for, for Lord, and there are different ways in which the word is used. In this case, you're talking about but the Messiah. Um, if that is, and I, you have me at a disadvantage, so I don't have it in front of me, the interlinear. But, um, okay, that does not necessarily mean Messiah. All right, so in, in curios means Lord, meaning sub, subject to. So when the word there is used, um, I'm so glad that you brought this up because this gives me another excuse to uh, talk about something. So when we talk to the Father, when we pray, when Jesus says we should pray like this in Matthew chapter 6, our Father who art in heaven, he's talking about God the Father. Sometimes when we pray, we say, oh Lord. Hebrews uh, gives us this imagery of Lord in curios, but also there can be another word for Lord. And in, in Revelation, it's interchangeable from time to time. I tell you, Ephesians chapter 4 says there's one Father, one God. There is one Lord for Christians, one Christ, one Messiah. And so these in the unfortunate Greek to English uh, are a little bit problematic in the Hebrew to the English, also somewhat problematic, because when we read in our text in the, in the uh, Old Covenant and we're opening up, we see, we see the word, the Lord said such and such. You have to look there. Is he saying Adonai or is he saying Yahweh or what is he using there or is Elohim? And so the words have to be taken into context. And so in this case, we have to uh, think of ourselves very carefully when we're praying, pray to the Father. We're not Stephen. We're not being stoned. We're not seeing the Jesus stand in, uh, and with his arms up for us. And so when we pray, we better be praying to the Father because we have no authority to do anything else. And we pray by his name and by his authority. That is Christ's name and by his authority. Now back to your point of this word, curious. It means to be a lower person than, not necessarily to mean Christ our Lord. And it, so in every use of the term Lord, in some cases, it's it, uh, in the text in the epistles, Paul uses this term Lord, and he's talking about the Father. But he says there, Lord God, always this, we're subject to you and you are God. In every case where he uses this curios word in the Greek, it is uh, speaking about the Father. He's saying, Lord God Almighty, in this case. One Lord, that's Kyria, one faith, one baptism, one God, Pater, and then Father is, uh, uh, one God is Theos. So you've got Kyrios for the Lord, Theos for God, and Pater for Father. So he breaks it down in three different terms. That's right. Three different points of view of the, the, the individual of God. Has. Yes, he does. <laughs> I'm in violent agreement. So your, your point is well taken, that how do you know that's the case? Um, I think the context, if we keep reading, you'll see it the way I do. But if you don't, I love you anyway. When we pray, let's pray to the Father, though, the way Jesus said for us to pray. And so let's pray through his name. Jesus' name. There's no mistaking who we're talking about there when we're talking about the Lord. All right. I got off my hobby horse. Now, let's go on to... I'm sorry. Yes, sir. I, I think we can. Yes. 
I, I, I believe that's right, and, and I think it'll become even more clear that it's talking about the Father here in just a, just a gif, uh, if we keep, keep reading, because he has the scrolls in his hand, and we're about ready to get to unsealing that scroll, and who is the he, the pronoun, sometimes is difficult, I, I grant you, and the curios is not terribly helpful in English, because Lord is Lord, but our Lord is one Lord, and the Lord, that is, God the Father is also re sometimes referred to as Lord. Very confusing. But, so, I, I, like I say, I love you. But I think it's the Father there. And I think we'll see it in just a second. All right. So, let me get through my crazy slides for the, before the hour is up. All right. So, the key, you might say to yourselves from Daniel's prophecy about how there's going to be a kingdom that will last forever and that he will rule the nations with an iron rod. Do you feel like the church is ruling over the nations with an iron rod today? If you're like I am, you, you think it's more like a fly swatter. <laughs> but you know what? If you are living in sin and you hear the word of God preached to you, if the pillar and the ground of truth, that is you and I, the church, if we're pointing out and rebuking error and it's nicely and in love. But it, if we're doing that, you know, that correction is not, not appreciated too much. And so in that sense, I believe he rules. We identify sin as, the, as, as subjects to the kingdom. The kingdom is identifying errant conduct and instructing in righteousness and rebuking false notions and uh, how many of them we could uh, point out. And warning of judgment to come. So, I better go on. The kingdom rules, in, in, uh, rules the nations today uh, in this way. And, and we see these capacities in which we serve and serve to rule, to judge uh, behavior and what's right and what's wrong and that type of thing. You say, well, that's not our place to do that. It is our place to carry that message and the message does the judging. We don't have to. So we're chosen. We're a chosen race, you and I. Those are members of the kingdom. We're a royal priesthood. We're supposed to be a holy nation, a people of his own possession, his, you know, a peculiar people, very special, uh, proclaiming the excellencies. He's called us out of darkness into marvelous light. That's how Peter puts it, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And then on in uh, chapter 24, he says that the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to the nations, to the goy. He's, he's talking to the Jews of his day, Jesus is, in, in Jerusalem. And he's saying to the goy, to the Gentiles, the goy, the Gentiles, the nations. In a sense, who is the Israel of God today? According to Galatians chapter 6, I think verse 16. The church is the Israel of God today. So you and I are speaking the truth to the Goy, to the nations, to the Gentiles, as a testimony to them. Uh, so that when judgment day comes and the great hearing comes before the throne of God, uh, there is a, the books will be open, as we'll see if I get quiet on this, and, and we'll, we'll be judged by the words that Jesus spoke. John chapter 12 and verse 48. Now, in all these things, we're more than conquerors. Were they feeling very strong? Are we feeling very strong? Well, if you're judging by your checkbook, probably not. If you're judging by how long the car works without needing repair or suffering some type of entropy in your body or, or your house, or whatever, you may not feel very strong. You may not feel like more than a conqueror. But I'm telling you, if you are no longer living a life in sin, a lot of us forget what it was like. We shouldn't look back too much, like it longingly, but it's sometimes helpful to reflect on how bad it was before we became Christians. And yet, many of us were blessed by having been reared by 
loving and gracious parents who, in a godly home, who knew righteousness and taught us, and so we didn't know the depths of sin, and somehow we avoided much of the consequence of that and the awful lifestyle. But there are plenty of us that uh, did not have that experience. And we see the effects of it. And so to the extent that we do not allow ourselves to be a part of the world and be conquered by sin and the lifestyle thereof, we're more than conquerors. All right, and then First uh, Timothy 3, we're the pillar and ground of truth. All right, yes. Yeah, a good point. Yeah, Chris, for those in internet land, Chris is suggesting that uh, he sits on his throne. The Father sits on his throne, Christ is sitting on his throne at his right hand. And he is supreme, whether it's acknowledged at this point in time on earth or not. Uh, he is ruling. And his judgments rule. They may not have the execution of the punishment yet, but the judgment is in effect. The, ju the, the righteousness of it, the law of it. Just like when you come into a, a town at uh, one in the morning, I think I was, driving through Dumas or Dalhart or someplace up there, it was cold and dark. And I was going through town at 40 and it was maybe 30 posted. And the guy pulled me over and he said, where are you going? You in a hurry? You know, and I said, no, sir, you know, long and short of it was, hey, not knowing what the speed limit is or not paying attention to what the speed, posted speed limit is, is not a defense. Being from Dallas, he, he forgave me and gave me a warning ticket, so I just went on, and I wasn't going real fast. But um, the law is the law. Supreme is supreme. I didn't sit there with the officer and say, yeah, you know, I didn't really know the law, so I really don't think that could be applying to me. Don't try that one. That probably won't work for you, and it's not going to work for any of us on Judgment Day. We will be judged by the words that Christ spoke. All right, so the 24 elders, look at verse 4. It's a kind of interesting, I think, um, that these um, would be the case. These 24 seats that are around the uh, throne, they must be symbolic of uh, the totality of God's saved people. The 12 uh, tribes of Israel, the 12 heads, the 12 apostles that served at those heads, where were they to go first? According to Romans and to Christ himself, they were to go to Jerusalem first and to Judea and then and to the outer parts, first starting with the house of Israel. Why did Jesus come? He said to save those who were lost of the house of Israel first. And so this uh, 12 apostles uh, to the new covenant, but serving under the old, the 12 tribes representing the uh, Old Testament saints. Um, this is symbolic language, difficult to know exactly who those people would have been. I wouldn't worry about that too much. But uh, we'll see here in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus talks about 12 of them will be uh, very similar language. Look at this. Peter says to them, See, we have, can you see Peter? Don't you love Peter? He says all the things you wouldn't dare say, right? We've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? What's in it for us? <laughs> he must have had a good fishing business. And Jesus said to him, to them, truly I say to you, in the new world that's in the new covenant, in this new thousand year reign on earth, no, not physical. We're living in it. It's not a physical, literal thousand years. It's the New Testament age. In this new world, in this new uh, covenant, 
after the old things have been put away, after the old covenant, is, it's hard for us to even relate to this because we're just so unattached to the old covenant. And that temple doesn't mean much to us. It meant everything to them. And so the new world, after 70 AD, that didn't exist anymore. When the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, after, he, after Pentecost, he's there. <laughs> and uh, he says, or actually before there, right? 40 days he's on the earth. Pentecost is 10 days later. So he's at the right hand of the Father even before Pentecost. And so the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. And who, uh, you who have followed me also will sit in the 12 thrones. When? You know, after these things have taken place, after they have had an opportunity to uh, enter into the kingdom, after they are preaching people into the kingdom, bringing good news of the kingdom, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, what were they doing when they were spreading the gospel? They were judging them with the word of God. And what did Jesus say in, in uh, Matthew 16? He said that, you will be given the keys of the kingdom, right? In what way? Not the keys of heaven, the keys of the kingdom of God. Who's going to enter? Who's not? That type of thing. And uh, judging the 12 tribes. So judging that is proclaiming and instructing and rebuking and correcting the Jews. And everyone who has left their houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and, you know, etc. They'll receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. All right, then, hey, you know, be last and you'll get to be first. All right, so this judging and being around the, the throne, I think we see those 12 thrones. So the 24, I think that very clearly would suggest that these are indeed related to um, uh, the, uh, these 12 apostles. All right, then, uh, when did the Son of Man come to sit on his throne? Acts 2, verse 33, gives us some indication that. Romans 8, 1 Peter 3, Hebrews chapter 1. It was after his ascension. He's, a, he's a, at the right hand of the Father, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, after the 40 days, after the ascension. He is there making intercession for us even today. He is ruling over his kingdom. What is Christ's kingdom? John chapter 18, Jesus said, my, my kingdom is not of this world. What did Pilate say? Are you a king? <laughs> You've said rightly. Oh, he, what did Pilate insist that he put in Latin and in Greek? And yeah, king of the Jews. Oh, the Pharisees, they didn't like that. Uh, say that he said he was the king of the Jews. No, no. No, he is the king of the Jews. His kingdom is not of this world. Don't be looking for Christ to literally re return and that Zionism in uh, what is uh, the, uh, the nation that refers, well, that Netanyahu is over today. That group, uh, that is not Christ's kingdom and that does not need to be literally restored to the earth. It, or else Thessalonians and Peter's comments about him when he returns and it all being burned up in the twinkling of an eye makes no sense. So we'll join and meet him in the air. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. And we'll be delivered up to the Father at that point, at Judgment Day. Not now, at Judgment Day. He's ruling presently. All right, better, better hustle. All right, in verse uh, 5. This language is used, chapter 4. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Does that remind you of Exodus chapter 19? When he's up on the mountain, they're so scared. They said, we can't even come close to the mountain. We have to stay away from it, stay far from it. Why? Because it scared them. And, and God said, well, don't let them come close. If they even touch it, they'll die. What, did, what could they hear? Smoke coming off the mountain and lightnings, and thunderings, and, you know, pretty, pretty impressive. That's the imagery that's used here. And uh, uh, other things, like the sea of glass, that would show an expanse, uh, uh, a grandeur, a beauty. How about verse 6? 
He discusses there the full of eyes, uh, as Greg's comment earlier. That is that God is able to see and be aware of all the facts without limitation. He doesn't have, you can't get one over on him. All right, in verse 8, you have the six-winged beast. For you Bible students, get into Isaiah chapter 6 sometime, and you'll see some similar language. Or get into Ezekiel sometime. If you're a grandparent, don't read the first few verses of Ezekiel to your grandchildren when they're real young because they'll get scared. It's pretty spooky language. This beast, it had a head of an eagle. And this beast, you know, and that kind of thing. And it had wings. Well, these are different. These are six-winged angels, whereas cherubim have four wings. And the seraphim have six wings. And why is there a difference? Because these cover, they take two wings to fly. The other ones, they just kind of go. We don't know how that works. All right, anyway, interesting to study. Uh, there, is, there are differences between these uh, creatures. Uh, you could probably do a lot on the power of the lion, the persistence uh, under load of the ox, the wisdom up or cunning of the man, the uh, ability and agility and keenness of the, of the eagle, but whatever. All right, All right. chapter 5. So here we have uh, this uh, scroll that's held in his hand. So I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now this is getting back to my, uh, my tussle with Jim as to which one. How do you know? Uh, I, and yet, I think you just have to read the uh, context of it. So this is why I say what I do, Jim. Because here we have the image seen of the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll that is written inside and on the back and sealed with seven seals. And we're not even going to get to the seventh seal today because it doesn't show up until after Steve's lesson next week. All right. They have an interruption because it's like one of those things where we have a we have a uh, advertisement that, that comes right before the last thing. So to be continued, you know. So you have the first seals open in chapter six, but the seven seals later. These seven seals are in his right hand in verse two, chapter five, Revelation. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, "Who's worthy? Who's worthy to open the the, the throne?" and to loose its seals. He had a better voice than I have. I don't know what his voice sounded like. Uh, get your best voice in your head. He had a stronger, more resonant voice than that. Uh, Who is worthy to open? I don't know what it was that sounded like. But it seems, you know, august in my, in my mind. James Earl Jones on steroids. All right. And no one in earth or on, uh, in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it, to look into it, to, to, you know, to read it. Think of it that way. Verse 4, so I wept, John says. I, I was looking forward to it so much. I wanted to see it so much. I, I, was, I felt sorry for the situation. You know, I wept, John says. I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and to read the scroll or to look at it. But some of the elders, probably apostles, I don't know, may have been some of the, 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 the leading guys from the old covenant. Some of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, and in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures in the midst of the elders stood, not sitting, Jim, stood the Lamb. That's our Lord. That's Christ. That's our Messiah. That's the anointed one of God. That is the Father's raised Son, the Lamb. The Lamb as though it had been slain, and on we could go. And verse 8, look at that. Now, when he had taken the scroll, 
All these things happen. Before the Lamb, they sing a new song. You're worthy. You're worthy. Why? Why is he worthy? Look at the song to open its seals. For you were slain. Verse 9. You were slain and you have redeemed us to God the Father. To my Father. To his Father. Uh, our Father. You have redeemed us to God by your blood. The antecedent to the pronoun is Christ. Your blood. Christ's blood. The Father didn't come down to the earth. He didn't leave heaven. He didn't live among us as men. The Son did. He came in the flesh. And He was raised by the Father. And so, as a, as a result, out of every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, He's made us, you and I, here today, and those there made us kings and priests to our God. We don't have to go through a confessional stand. We don't have to go to some clergyman. We don't have to do any of that. Why? He's made us priests to our God. He has reconciled us to the Father through him. If anybody comes to the Father, he has to go through me, Jesus said. John 14, verse 6, we've run out of time. Oh, I had so many more hobby horses to ride. Thank you so much. I'll send this out. You'll see my other crazy thoughts later by email. Thank you so much.